could still be in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. There's just a couple of thoughts that I want to uh, bring forth from this chapter. Let's look at verse 15. Galatians 6, 15. It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So what's being compared there in verse 16? Uh, verse 15. What is the circumcision or the uncircumcision? It's a mark, and I won't go into all the details right now, but it's something that was marked in the physical flesh. It was something that God had required Abraham and his descendants to do to, to uh, be identified physically at least as the people of God. Okay? But here in the New Testament, it's telling us being circumcised or being not uncircumcised profits you nothing. It avails you nothing. What does profit you though? The new creature. But a new creature. Now the topic that I want to preach on tonight is my favorite topic. In fact, I just preached on this just a few weeks ago in my other church. Um, but it's such an important topic. And I personally find that Christians forget this time and time again. Honestly, it is such a basic truth. And I think as a new church, it's good to just get through these basic truths. And I promise you, even though you know this, even though you'll be like, yep, I've heard this before, Kevin, yeah, I know all this stuff. You're going to be reading the Bible one day, and you're going to ask me a question, and I'll be like, oh, because you forgot that simple truth. I promise you, that's what's going to happen. Okay, so this is really important, okay, the difference between the flesh and the spirit, or the new man and the old man. Okay, the new man in the Bible has many, new na has many names. That's the part of you that's born again. That's the part of you that's born of the spirit. Okay, it's given the name of the inner man, the new man, the new creature. Uh, what else? What are the names? Yeah, there's lots of them. The spirit. Okay, uh, and then we've got the old man, the flesh, the carnal mind. Or when you talk about the carnal Christian, all these names refer to that flesh. Okay, so we're going to talk about the old man and the new man. And this is something that I did preach. Uh, in the church in Punchbowl, probably about a year and a half ago, but I think it's a good topic to, to go through again. Okay? Now, if you can please turn to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Okay? Because if you're born again, if you're a believer, there is a dual nature in you. There's two of you. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. There's the old man, and there's the new man. And guess what? They don't like one another. Okay? This is a battle in your body between these two men, and, who, and who's going to be in charge of, of your life, sort of at, at that moment, or you know, during the day. This is a true battle that takes place, place in all our lives. You know, sometimes we think about the battle with the world, or we think about the battle with, with the forces of darkness, with, with the devil and his forces, his kingdom. But at the same time, we, when we talk about these things, we often forget about the battle within our own bodies as believers. Okay? Now, if you look, you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. I just want to pull out this, this very uh, basic truth here. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Okay, it's all about your, your, your whole, uh, the person of, of, uh, of your wholeness. It says that, And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice there are three parts of us in this chapter? There's the, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Right? The body, the soul, and the spirit. And what I'm going to say to you right now, uh, and I'll prove this later on, is that the body is that old man. The body is that flesh. Okay? The spirit is the new man. Okay? The spirit is that new creature. And the soul, people sometimes don't know the difference between the soul and the spirit, but the soul is the, I guess, the true you. The, the, the part of you that never changes, okay, as a believer. And I, we'll, we'll look at this very soon. But the first thing I want you to understand, this is, this is, some people call this a trinity of man. Because me, a man has that triune nature as well, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, the first thing, let's talk about the body, because that's probably the easiest thing to understand. Your body, this flesh... We know it very well, right? We all have it. I can see that you all have that body. It's something that is visible, okay? And the reason why God has given you a physical body is so that you can interact in a physical world, okay? If you didn't have the physical body, you wouldn't be able to shake my hand or speak to me or sing praises with your tongue, okay? The physical body is to interact in this tangible, physical world. 
But you know, this physical body is not eternal. Obviously, it's corrupted, it gets sick, it gets diseases, you get older, and at some point, it dies. At some point, it passes away. It's not eternal. I'll just read to you very quickly James 4.14, which says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Your life is a vapor. This body is here for one moment and it's gone the next. When you compare it to all eternity, it is but a vapor. I mean, you've probably, you know, made coffees or teas and you've seen the vapor, the steam rise up and then it's gone. It's there a moment and it's gone the next. In reality, that is what our bodies are. They're not here forever. And I'm now, how old am I? 30? 37? I'm 37 now. I can't believe it. You know, I just feel like it was yesterday when I was in school. Just yesterday when I was a child running around. You know, I have fun with the kids when they want to play. I remember the same kind of games they play. And now I'm like an old man. I'm getting white hairs and stuff like that. Like, it's, it's here a moment. You know, maybe I've lived half my life. You know, as long as there's no major accidents. And I might have another half to go and that's the end of it, right? But then we have all eternity to think about. The other thing that I want you to be aware of, and you don't need to turn there, I'll just read some passages to you. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, is that this body, and this is very important to understand, this body, this flesh and blood that I'm in right now and that you're in, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, pay attention to these words, Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So the Bible calls this flesh and blood what? Corruption. Okay? This body is corruptible in the eyes of God. Why? Because we have that sin nature in us. And when we commit sins, it's in this flesh. It's in this body. And it says this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Because corruption cannot inherit Incorruption. So the kingdom of God, heaven and eternity, the new heavens and the new earth to come are incorruptible. There, there, there is no sin in that place. And so we cannot come in our sinful, corrupted bodies into that place. I mean, if God allowed that, we'd just mess it up. we just bring our corruption, our sinful nature into that place and just make things as bad as it is today. All right? So this is such an important thing. Because the, 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 you know, the religions out there, or, or so-called Christians, that say, well, to be saved, you need to turn from your sins. You have to clean up your life. What are they saying? They're trying, they're trying to say you, you, you have to reform the flesh. But the Bible says the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There's, there's no amount of good you can do. There's no amount of, uh, amount of commandments you can keep that will keep you, that will, um, will call you to inherit um, everlasting life. Because once you've committed that one sin... Your body is corrupted, right? So you need to understand this. We cannot go to heaven in this flesh and blood, in this, uh, this body that we're in. Okay? The other thing that I want you to, I'll just read to you quickly, Hebrews 9, 27. It says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Once to die, and after this the judgment. There are no second chances to life. You know, sometimes you go door knocking, you speak to, to a Buddhist, or some new age, one of these people, you know, with the Eastern sort of mysticism. And quite often they'll say, well, when I die, I'll come back. I'll be reincarnated. No. It's appointed for man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Okay? This is the, the only chance we have at life on this earth. Okay? As we are. Now, there's a future millennium. That's a different topic altogether. But just as things are right now, this is our one chance of life. And, you know, it really makes us think about the people that we need to witness to. This is their one chance. You know, when we hear about people passing away or some car crash, I mean, we think about how many people are on their way to hell because they've not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay? So we need to understand these things, that the body is corrupted and it will pass away. It's not eternal. The next thing that I want to talk to you guys about is the spirit. We have the body, the spirit... And the soul. You guys can turn to Romans 7 now. Romans 7. Turn to Romans 7. This, is one, this passage is pretty important to understand. But you might say, well, why do we need a spirit? You know, what's the point of having a spirit? Well, think about the body. If the body allows us to interact in a physical world, then what does the spirit allow us to do? If we have a living spirit, it's going to allow us to interact 
in the spiritual world. It's going to allow us to, uh, to fellowship with God himself. It's going to allow the Holy Spirit to talk uh, to our spirit, right? And to know what God has laid out for us in the scriptures. Okay? So just as much as the physical body allows us to interact in the physical world, the spirit allows us to interact in the spiritual world, in the kingdom of God, spiritually. Now, I can't see your spirit, okay? But you've got one. You know, if you're saved, it's living. If you're unsaved, it's dead, okay? Have a look at Romans 7, verse 9. Romans 7 verse 9. So what I want to show you here is that unbelievers are spiritually dead. They've got a spirit, but it's dead. Okay, We all have the body, soul, and spirit, but the spirit of the unbeliever is dead. Romans 7 verse 9. This is uh, Paul speaking. He says, For I was alive without the law once. So, I mean, think about these words that he's saying. He says, I was alive without the law once. So he's saying, I was once alive. Does that mean he's dead? Well, I mean, he's, he's writing this letter, but somehow he was dead, right? Somehow. And then he says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what he's saying here is when I saw the law of God, when I saw the commandments of God, sin revived, I realized that I was a sinner in the sight of God and I died. There comes a point in all our lives, and I believe it's a pretty young age, when we understand, like little children, innocent children, little babies, they cannot understand these things. But at some point in our life, we get to a certain place of maturity where we understand that in the sight of God, we're sinners. We understand that we've come short of His commands and His laws. We've come short of His glory. And we know that, hey, the sin revives in us and we realize we spiritually die. Not physically, but spiritually. They sp he spiritually died. Look at verse number 10. Romans 7 verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found uh, to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, it slew me. So it's saying, it killed me. When I realized I was a sinner, when I saw the commands of God, it slew me. It killed me. But what part of him died? It was his spirit. Okay, not physically dead. Was, he's writing this letter. He died spiritually. And so everybody goes through this process. Everybody at some point realizes that they're a sinner in the sight of God and they spiritually die. Please turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And by the way, this is the reason why, as you turn in there, this is the reason why, you know, I believe and, and many other uh, people like us that are like minded believe that little babies, when they die, they go to heaven. Okay, because they didn't get to a point, a little child, a child that's been aborted, which is an evil thing anyway. Okay, but if you lose a little baby, a little child at an early age, that they're in heaven. Because they've not been spiritually dead, that they don't have the knowledge enough, they haven't got enough wisdom, they haven't got enough clarity to understand what the law of God is. And they haven't gone through that spiritual death process that everybody else has gone through. And I think that probably even applies to people that are mentally handicapped. You know, like Down syndrome, some people are, are really severe and they're like a little child in their mind. Okay, but then there are some people that have Down syndrome and they're not so bad and they can understand the gospel and they can be saved. So, you know, it comes down to the individual, it comes down to each person. But look at Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. So obviously this is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, the story of um, Adam and Eve, look at verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, the Lord commanded Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day, pay attention to this phrase, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So what did God say? If they ate from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they shall what? Surely die. When? Look at it again, verse 17. For in the day, the very day they eat of that tree, they will surely die. Okay? Now, is God a liar? Of course not. Okay? God is telling us the absolute truth. But the question I want to ask you is, when, they, when Adam and Eve partook of that fruit, did they physically die? No, they were still there, right? They were, they were, but how did they die? Because we know that God cannot lie. That is a true statement of God. That they would surely die on that day. They died spiritually. Okay? That's the point that Adam and Eve died spiritually. 
and that sinful nature was brought into the world. Okay, so again, we all, we, we can't blame Adam and Eve. Okay, I mean, I guess you can to some extent, but we've all committed our own sins, and we've all you know uh, offended God by breaking His commandments and His laws. Okay, that's the spirit. If you're unsaved, it's sp- you're spiritually dead. Okay, the third part of man is the soul. Okay, again, the soul is unseen. And a lot of people get confused between the soul and the spirit. And I can understand why. Okay, But here's the thing about the soul. The, your soul, again, is eternal. It's something that lasts forever. And you want, obviously want your soul to be in heaven. You don't want to spend eternity, your soul, in hell. There's a reason why we call it soul winning. When we go out and knock doors, preach the gospel, we don't call it spirit winning. We don't call it body winning. We call it soul winning. Okay? Because it's the soul that needs to be saved. And what I'm going to show you later on is that you know, God gives us a new spirit. And if you're saved, one day He's going to give you a new body. But you'll never get a new soul. Because it's the soul that receives salvation. Okay? It, when we talk about, obviously, going to heaven, okay, the soul is what receives uh, salvation. Now... As soon as you're saved, you receive that new spirit. You're born of the spirit, okay? But again, once you have that uh, uh, new spirit and your body dies, then we know that spirit goes to God and the soul will go with that spirit to God. But if your body dies and you're not saved, you're not born of the spirit, you're spiritually dead, that soul and spirit will spend eternity in hell and then eventually into the lake of fire, which hell itself will be cast into. Okay, so really your salvation is determined on whether you are spiritually dead or spiritually alive. Now just to show you a a few passages very quickly, you guys can turn to Psalm 86. Turn to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. And I'm going to read from you in Hebrews 10.39. You guys go to Psalm 86. Hebrews 10.39 says... But we are not of them who draw back into, uh, unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, it's the saving of the soul that takes place at that moment. Okay. Now if you're in Psalms 86, look at verse 12. Psalm 86 verse 12. It says, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy, thy name Forevermore, Verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So you can see there that it's a soul that needs to be saved, right? It's a soul that needs to be saved because you don't get a new soul. You get the new spirit and you'll get a new body. So God's solution, obviously, is to provide for us that new spirit that's living and a new body that's not corrupted. Because right now, again, we are in these corrupted bodies. So when we think about the unbeliever, we think about them, that they're living in their physical body, which is corrupted. They've got a dead spirit. And we know that this is the one chance of life. They are actually like a ticking time bomb. Okay, they're going by day by, you know, day by day. Each day they live, they get a little closer to uh, dying without Jesus Christ and going into hell. And all it takes is a car crash, all it takes is some heart attack, some illness, and that's it. They're done for. Which is why it's so important for us as believers to have the eternal words of God to go out there and preach the gospel to these people. Okay? We ought to have a love for the unsaved because we were once the unsaved. And someone loved us enough to give us the gospel to be saved. So that is definitely something we need to do. Please turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 1. John chapter 3. It's a very famous chapter. John chapter 3, verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And isn't it amazing that, that Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came and just told the honest truth to Jesus. We know you're of God. But how many of the Pharisees rejected Jesus Christ? Knowing full well he was of God. That's a scary thought, right? And if they rejected Jesus Christ, thank God for Nicodemus. We see later on that he believed on Christ. 
Uh, we think of Paul, the apostle. He was a Pharisee. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, there are other Pharisees in the book of Acts that get saved. Uh, I think Crispus is one of them. And there was another one. I can't remember all the names. But there's, a, there's quite a few uh, Pharisees that did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of them were so confused. They, they were believers. And they were trying to get um, the, the, the church to be circumcised. Because they thought that was a necessary part. They still had it in their mind. Understood the differences from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But for the large part, the Pharisees rejected Jesus. But they knew he was of God. They knew that. Anyway, that's, another, that's a side thought. Look at verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So remember that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? So what do we need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? Or at least in this case, see the kingdom of God. We must be born again. Okay? Now look at verse number 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus is thinking physical. He's thinking bodily. Now I don't know if he's being serious or he's just joking or having a bit of a laugh at Jesus saying, Hey, how can I be born again when my mother's old? Uh, verse number 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. I love that. <laughs> goes, yep, yep, you're right, Nicodemus. You know, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, so what do we need to do to enter into the kingdom of God, according to what we've seen so far? You must be born of water and of the Spirit. Okay, now a lot of people get this really mixed up. I remember when I was a teenager uh, and I had a knock on the door and there were these Mexican... I don't know, some church from Mexico, they had established a new church in, in the area. And um, I, we were talking about salvation. I was telling them, hey, no, it's not by works, it's by faith. And I think they took me over here to this passage. And they were trying to show me that being born of water was baptism. Now, we had, a, we had two baptisms on Sunday. Uh, and obviously, I made it very clear then that baptism does not save anybody. Okay? Now what's funny about this, a lot of religions teach that. A lot of teachers, religions teach that being born of the water is baptism. But it's so weird because verse number 6, Jesus clarifies what he means. Right? You must be born of water and of the Spirit. And then verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So we see there Jesus clarifying in verse number 6. That being born of water is being born of the flesh. And that being born of the spirit, well, is being born of the spirit. Okay, so in order for us to go to heaven, first of all, you must be born of the flesh. You must be born of water. Okay, now my wife's heavenly pregnant. That little baby is surrounded by the amniotic fluid. And that is like 99.9% .9 water. Okay, and we still use that language today when, you know, with, when Christina's or any pregnant woman's about to give birth. You know, the waters break. And that's the terminology that we use. You know, the pregnancy waters. Okay, and it's mostly, it, it is mostly water. Okay, and so being born of the flesh or being born of the water is just your natural birth. Obviously, you have to be born as a human being to ultimately go to the kingdom of God. Okay, ultimately you must be a human. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying, right? And then, but not only that, you must be born of the Spirit. So that there's a difference between the flesh and the Spirit. Okay? There's a difference between those two things. Now, obviously, John 3, 16. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we know what it takes to be born of the Spirit. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's His death, burial, and resurrection that's going to get us saved. That's going to give us, uh, give us the, um, that's going to allow us to be born of the Spirit. Okay. So if you're saved today, you've been born of the Spirit. Okay. You have a living body, but you also have a living Spirit, and this is how God can speak through you. The Holy Spirit can interact with your spirit and can teach you the words of God, and God can empower you. Through, the, through that new life, that new spirit that you have, the new creature, if you will. Okay? The new man. All these words are the same idea. This new man that's been born again, that's been born of the spirit. And because I said to you that all of the sins that we commit, and the Bible teaches this obviously, are all in our flesh, 
in this physical body, that new man, that new spirit never sins. And we're going to look at this later on. But that new man is born of God, okay, never sins, but you're going to continue to sin because you still have the old man. You still have the flesh. And this is the dual nature that you have as a believer. This is the challenge. This is the battle that we fight every single day. And I personally believe as soon as you wake up in the morning, you're in the old man. And you're not in the new creature. You're not walking in the spirit, the Bible talks about. Okay? And you've got to make conscious effort to submit the flesh to the spirit. Okay? When you're tempted to sin, you can either go, well, I'm going to sin in the flesh. I'm going to walk after the flesh. Or I'm going to walk in the spirit and overcome that temptation so that I don't sin. This is the battle. This is why when often you commit sin, you get so upset, you get so angry. You know, the sin was pleasurable for a season, you know, to the body, to the flesh. But then the inner man, the spirit, that which is clean and pure, struggles with that, you know. And, and quite often, this is why this is such an important topic, is because I've met so many Christians that commit some, some sin. And they're like, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. How, if I'm saved, how can I keep committing these sins? It's because they forgot about the dual nature. You know, for, for some reason they thought that when I got saved, the old man was gone. No, it's still there. <laughs> that flesh is still there and it's going to be there for the rest of our lives or until the Lord comes you know, and raptures his believers and gives us those resurrected bodies. So we need to be aware of the, of the flesh and of the spirit. A very simple concept. Again, let me repeat that. Everyone that's alive has been born of the flesh. But then when you understand the commands and you understand the laws of God, you die in the spirit because you realize that you are a sinner in the sight of God. Okay? And so that spirit needs to be made alive again so the soul can be saved. And that's when we're born of the spirit. When we hear the gospel and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we still have the corrupted bodies. Okay? We still have this corrupted flesh. We still sin and we still struggle with sins until we have those new resurrected bodies that God has promised us at the resurrection. So let me show you a couple of passages here. Please turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. And let me show you how when you don't read the Bible with this in mind, you can get very confused. And I've seen this again. People that ought to know better, such a basic truth, get confused when they read the Bible. And I've had people say to me, I can't understand 1 John. But it's so easy. Okay? In fact, a lot of these, a lot of these, these are books touch upon the old man and the new man, the spirit and the flesh, over and over again. It's a real major theme in, in the epistles. Okay? But again, if you forget it, it's going to confuse you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, if you've been saved, you've been born of God. You've been born again, right? But the Bible says here that if that's happened, you cannot commit sin. Did you read that? You cannot commit sin. And it says, for his or God's seed... So there's a part of God that remains in us, that, that creates that new man, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. And so people read a passage like this, and they're like, oh, but I just sinned today. I just sinned yesterday or whatever. I must not even be saved. I must not even be born of God. But is it the flesh, this sinful nature that was born of God? What part of you does not sin? For this to be true... There is a part of you that cannot sin. And if you look at it again there, it says, Whosoever is born of God. Was your flesh born of God? No, your body was not born of God, right? It, this is born of Adam, of your mother, okay? So it's not talking about the flesh. You're going to continue to sin in your flesh. Now this is not a license to go around and sin. Well, obviously we should overcome these things, but this is a reality of our Christian life. Okay, It's the spirit, the new man, that does not commit sin. Because it's the new man that was born of God. right? It's the new man that will inherit uh, the kingdom of God. Because as we read earlier, the flesh and blood cannot inherit 
the kingdom of God because it's corrupted. Okay. Now turn to uh, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Same author, same book. All right. Said we cannot sin. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Oh, that sounds contradictive, right? I mean, it said in chapter 3 that we cannot sin, but now it's saying that if, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. So if you ever meet it, and I've met people like this, you meet someone and they say, ah, oh, I no longer sin. I don't commit any sin. Are they, are they lying to me? Well, I guess they are lying to me, but really they're deceiving themselves. Okay, because nobody can truly live a life without sin. Okay, sounds contradictive. But now that we understand the dual nature of, of, a, of a believer, what part of you is the part that, that commits sin? The flesh. And what part of you is the part that doesn't commit sin? The spirit, the new man. Okay, so now what seems contradictive is perfectly understandable when we understand the dual nature. And you'll find as you read for the Bible, you've got to keep this stuff in mind. Okay? As you live your life, you're going to have to keep this in mind. Otherwise, you're going to start doubting your salvation, forgetting that the sins you've committed are in the flesh, not in the new man, not in the inner man. The inner man stays perfect and pure because it's born of God. It's the Spirit. It's got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ upon it. Okay, let's keep reading there. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is not salvation. This is us as Christians. As we go through our Christian walk and we commit sin, we need to make sure that on a regular basis we confess those sins. Okay, And what does it say about God? That He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? Something you need to keep in mind as a believer is yes, the old man and the new man, okay, but also your position and your walk with God. The new man positionally is perfect. When God looks at the new man through the veil of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, we are perfect in his sight. But then we have our daily walk. Okay? And our daily walk sometimes is in the spirit, sometimes it's in the flesh. Every time we sin, it's in the flesh. Every time we seek to please ourselves, it's in the flesh. There's that battle. The new man wants to please God. The new man wants to keep the commandments. The new man wants to be in church. The new man wants to learn all the things of God and be fed the word of God. Okay? But then the old man wants to please himself. The old man wants to sin. The old man doesn't want to do the things that God has laid out for, for us to do. Which is why it's so important that we learn to, sub, uh, learn to submit our flesh to that new man, to the spirit, and walk in the spirit. Uh, verse number 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Again, you can't go around saying you don't sin. Okay? Otherwise, you're making God a liar. God says, no, you are a sinner. Okay? But in order for us to maintain a clean walk, yes, we need to walk in the spirit. But when we fail, when we sin, we need to confess our sins daily to Him. Otherwise, we create this division between God, God and ourselves, and God's going to feel distant from us. And again, that's another reason why people doubt their salvation. Because they feel like the presence of God is so far away. Maybe I'm not even saved. No, it's probably more likely you've not confessed your sins, and you need to make, be, be made right with God, just in your walk. Not in your position, you're saved. But just in your daily walk to maintain sweet fellowship with God. Think about the heresy of you can lose your salvation. I mean, so many people believe you can lose your salvation, okay? And the reason they believe that is because they think, well, if you continue, even after you've believed on Jesus, even though Jesus paid for all your sins, your past, present, and future sins to come, even though that's happened, if you don't maintain a clean and holy life, if you continue in habit, habitual sin, then you can lose your salvation. Well, this teaching of the old man and the new man really makes that heresy look stupid. Okay, because think about these things. You know, first of all, let me let me again just make sure this is well understood. If you're a believer, you have that dual nature in you, right? The flesh, the flesh is still here. That's the sinful nature, and you have the new man, the spirit, which is perfect without sin. Okay? 
And we know the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, which is why God has promised us those resurrected bodies to come, which cannot sin. Okay? So, let's say I was, I don't know, a fornicator. Okay? And then someone gives me the gospel and I continue in fornication. Or I continue in drunkenness. Okay? Or for the rest of my life, I continue those things. Till I die. And someone can turn around and say, well, see, because you lived, you continued a life of sin, then you were never saved or you lost your salvation. Okay? But again, what part of you sins? It's the old man. It's the flesh. And does the flesh inherit the kingdom of God? No. So how can the old man lose something he never had? The old man was never saved. The old man's never going to heaven. Okay? We either get to heaven when this old man dies and we go spiritually, or if we make the resurrection, we make the rapture, then God's going to give us those new bodies. And then we'll be able to go to heaven in those new bodies. But this old flesh, which sins, you know, if I continue in fornication and drunkenness, it's all in this flesh. It never had salvation. It was always going to have to die anyway. So how can you lose something you never had? Does that make sense? You cannot lose something you never had. But then you have the other part of you, the new man, which is a spirit, which is clean, which is perfect, without sin. Right? And then when you do sin, that new man stays perfect. That new man stays pure. Okay? It's not the new man committing any sin. So if this new man never commits any sin, how can it lose salvation if it's perfect? Right? Because it's a new man which allows us to enter into the kingdom of God. And so you can see that just by understanding this dual nature, that nobody can truly believe that you can lose your salvation. Those that believe you can lose your salvation do not understand this basic truth in the Bible. Okay? They think it's your works. They think it's your lifestyle that will get you to heaven rather than being born again through salvation uh, in Jesus Christ. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I know we read from chapter 6. But let's have a look at this very quickly. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Because am I saying then that, you know, just go ahead and sin all you want. Now is that really what we want to learn from this? Of course not. Of course we should strive to live a holy, clean life. Of course we should learn to overcome temptations in our life. Okay? But Galatians 5 16. So how do we do it? Galatians 5.16 It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do we overcome the lust of the flesh? Which then brings sin. We need to walk in the Spirit. Okay? Now notice this is a command. You know, when you're saved, you don't automatically walk in the Spirit. We're commanded to walk in the Spirit. Okay? Because walking in the Spirit is not salvation. But walking in the Spirit is a necessity of our Christian life to maintain good fellowship with the Lord. And when we fail, we confess our sins, as we saw in 1 John, to make sure that things are right between, uh, in our walk with, with the Lord. Okay? We need to walk in the Spirit. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So the Spirit wants to do certain things. Like I said, it wants to please God. It wants to live that holy life and be in church and, and all these things. But it doesn't get to do the things that it would because the flesh is lusting against it. And when you give in to the flesh, you're not, give, you're not walking in the Spirit. Okay? Again, this battle, this constant battle that's in your life to the day we die. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit... Ye are not under the law. Okay? If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. What, that, what does that mean? It means if we're walking in the new man, in the Spirit, we are not under the law. Now, what does that mean? Um, obviously, that means that if we walk in the flesh, we are under the law. Okay? Now, what that means is, obviously, the new Spirit, that, that new man cannot sin. Okay? And I've used... I'm going to use, I've used this silly illustration, but I think it makes the most sense. Let's say this speaker here. I'm going to make a law, I'm going to make a rule that nobody can touch the speaker with their hands. Okay? Nobody can touch the speaker with their hands. So if I do this, if I do this, I'm breaking the law, right? 
But even if I don't do it, I have the ability to break the law. So because that law exists, I'm under that law. Okay, I can break that law. Okay? And remember, what was that rule? If you touch the speaker with your hands. Okay? Now, what if I had no hands? What if I was born without hands or I lost my hands in an accident? Could I break that law? No. I mean, I could touch it with my elbow or touch it with my head, but I wouldn't be able to touch it with my hands. Okay? And so in that case, because it's impossible for me to break that law, I am not under the law. Okay? So that new spirit, which is sinless, cannot sin. You're not under the law in the new man because that new man cannot sin. Okay, which is why we need to walk in the Spirit to overcome the sins that we have in our life. Now, uh, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're almost done here, guys. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. How do we empower ourselves to walk in the Spirit? You know? Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay, so if you're a farmer and you sow seeds of wheat, what are you going to reap? Wheat. If you sow seeds of corn, what are you going to get? Corn. Okay? Look at verse number 8. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit... Shall the Spirit reap life everlasting? So, you know, we're using this analogy of a farmer sowing seed. You know, your life, you are a farmer for either your flesh or your spirit. Okay? You can either sow to the flesh, you know, with the world's entertainment, with the world's music, with the lust of the eyes and the, and the pride of life and the lust of the flesh. You know, you can seek your own pleasures in this life. And if you're doing all those things... You're sowing to the flesh. And if you keep sowing to the flesh, what are you going to reap? Corruption. Because your, your flesh is corrupted. It's sinful. Okay? The more you give in to this world and your flesh, the more likely you are to sin. The less likely you are, you, uh, uh, um, you are to overcome those sins. Okay? If you're struggling with lust, and you continue looking at, at women, you know, a certain way, or, or looking at pornography or things like that, it's going to be more difficult to overcome that temptation. And that goes for every sin, whatever it is. Okay? And so how should we ought to sow? We ought to sow to the Spirit. Okay? We ought to do things like go soul winning. Okay? That's something the Spirit wants to do. And I've admitted this many times, but I don't wake up wanting to go soul winning. This is why I think we're always in the flesh when we wake up. Right? But then when you're, when you're out there doing the soul winning, isn't it exciting? The new man is excited. The new man wants to do it. The new man rejoices when someone gets saved. Now, I, I liken it to, the, to going to a gym. I, don't, I haven't gone to a gym for many, many years, as, as you can tell. But um, it's hard to get there. But once you're doing it, hey, this feels good. Right? It feels good. It's the same kind of idea. You know, you have that new man that loves to be in church. Again, it's hard. On a Tuesday night to be in church after work, getting the family, coming out here. But then when you're here, the new man loves it. The new man's being fed. It's, it's, um, it's, it's in the presence of the Lord, worshipping the Lord. The new man loves it, right? So we need to sow to that new man. We need to sow to the Spirit so that way we can be stronger in the Spirit than in the flesh. One example that I've heard that, that's, really, that's a really good example is, you know, if you had two dogs, you know, and, and you, you loved one dog, and you, you know, you sold to that one dog, you know, you fed it, you looked after that dog, if the dog got sick, you took it to the vet, you made sure that it got its walk, you know, you gave it a bath, you cleaned it, and then you had another dog that you didn't like, and you, you didn't give that dog food, it starves, you know, if it gets sick, you don't take it to the vet. What's going to happen if those two dogs fight? Which one's going to win? Obviously the dog that's been fed, that's, that's um, healthy, that's strong, that's the dog that's going to win the battle, okay? And so if you're someone that keeps sowing to the flesh again and again and again, seeking after this world and the pleasures of the world and the money and, uh, you know, the lust of the eyes and all these things, guess what? When you're tempted to sin, which one's going to win? The flesh. The flesh is stronger because you've not been sowing to that spirit. 
And I, you, I don't know if you've been, I've been, I've been here where I've not picked up my Bible for weeks. Days and weeks. Especially when I was a younger believer. And then all of a sudden, it's like a part of you starving. And then I was like, when, when, that, when that soul, uh, that spirit realizes, man, I need, I need to hear preaching. I need to be in church. I need to read the Bible. And then you get excited and you read the Bible and you're like, Genesis, Exodus. And you keep going, you keep going. And then at some point, again, the, the, you know, the, the flesh says, hey, you know, not so fast, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's this battle in you all the time, you know. And if, if you neglect the spirit, the spirit at some point will fight back. Okay, but again, you know, you probably you probably reaped a lot of corruption in your life during that process. Okay, so there's there's great merit, guys, in your Bible reading, your daily devotions with God, confessing your sins to God, being in church, going soul winning, singing praises to God in your hearts or in the church, whatever. All these spiritual acts is not a waste of time. You're so into the Spirit. The more we do it, the more likely you are to walk in the Spirit. And when those temptations come, the Spirit will be stronger and be able to overcome that flesh. Okay, So that's the, that's the principle, guys. Soul to the Spirit and not to uh, the flesh. Please turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Again, I, I told you guys that I, I know a lot of Christians and I, I can think of some uh, examples of people that I've known that get really discouraged in their Christian walk because they know they should be doing better, but they've sinned. They don't want to be in church anymore. They get discouraged. They're low. They're down. And uh, you know why? Because they've forgotten this principle. They've forgotten that there's a dual nature of man. Again, they keep thinking, how can I be so sinful? How can I keep committing the same sins over and over again? And, and they, they get so down and so depressed. And it's hard to be around these Christians. It's hard to motivate them. It's hard to encourage them. Because they, they, you know, they, they've been failing in their flesh. And they, they keep thinking, am I even saved? Am I, am I, what's going on? And they get so discouraged. Okay, But I want to say to you, and by the way, 1 John. Confess your sins daily. If you don't do that, you're going to get into that state. Because the presence of the Lord will be so far away for you that you're going to feel like, man, where is the Lord? Is He even listening to me anymore? Okay? But Matthew 26, verse 40. Matthew 26, verse 40. And this is shortly before Jesus Christ was arrested and crucified. And remember when He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, He went with some of His disciples and He asked them to watch and pray. I mean, this was a time that Jesus needed His friends more than ever. Okay? He was about to be crucified, taken, arrested, and beaten, and, and, and uh, lied about, and whipped, and crown of thorns, and all that kind of stuff. He needed his friends at this point in time, and he asked them, can you please watch and pray? Can you try to encourage me as well? And you guys know the story. He finds them sleeping. Not once, twice at least. Look at verse 40. Matthew 26, verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Peter, just one hour. Couldn't you do that? Verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's such an important principle. Jesus knows that your spirit indeed is willing, but he also knows that your flesh is weak. Okay? And when you fail... When you sin and you fail, listen, don't, you don't need to hide your face from God. Jesus knows. Remember, He came as a man. He suffered every point as we did in, in the temptations. He knows how hard it is. He knows that our flesh is weak, but He knows your spirit is willing. And so please, don't get down and depressed and in the dumps when you fail. And you fail and you fail. You're going to fail for the rest of your life. Please get used to it. Okay? Now, I don't want you to fail for the rest of your life, but that's a reality. You're going to continue sinning, but Jesus understands is my point. He understands that your flesh is weak. And so you need to go to Him because, again, I can, I'll tell you, and I'm sure you can relate to this, there's been times that I've committed a sin. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Help me not to do it again. Next day, again, the same one. It's like, God, please forgive me. And then again, it's like, oh, man, I'm not... God's not going to hear me again, right? 
Is it really good? I mean, surely he's sick of me by now that I haven't been able to overcome this sin in my life. Jesus knows. Look, they fell asleep more than once. He understood that the flesh was weak, but the spirit was willing. And let me say to you, when you get down in the dumps, please, don't get so down and depressed because the spirit is willing and Jesus knows. Just go to him, ask for forgiveness, start that fellowship once again, start the Bible reading again, get in church again, go out soul winning again, whatever it takes to make sure that you're, you're so into that spirit rather than having a pity party for yourself, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord,